In this video, I'll be going through the 2012 Atoms, Photons and Nuclei exam. Question 1. Use the information in the table and the graph to answer the following questions. In the list above, nickel and iron have the highest binding energy per nucleon. Explain which nuclide on the list has the highest total binding energy. We see that iron and nickel have the same binding energy per nucleon, but because nickel has more nucleons, with 62 as opposed to 58, it's going to have the higher binding energy. Although they have the same binding energy per nucleon, nickel has more nucleons, so it has a larger total binding energy. Explain how stars, which are composed mostly of hydrogen, can release huge amounts of energy. Hydrogen is fused into larger nuclei with a much greater binding energy per nucleon. Because the fused nuclei occupy a much lower energy state, the excess energy is released. If a star reaches a stage where it has formed a core rich in iron and nickel, it suddenly stops burning. Explain why this happens. Iron and nickel have the highest binding energy per nucleon, so will not release energy from being fused into larger nuclei. When a star has used up much of its hydrogen and helium, it begins carbon burning. One of the reactions to occur is this one here. Calculate the energy released in this reaction, and hence determine the mass deficit in the reaction. For this we need to determine the difference in our binding energy. From up here we can get our binding energies per nucleon. For carbon it's 12.29, for neon it's 12.85, and for helium it's 11.32. All of these are times 10 to the minus 13 joules. For our binding energy before, we have two carbon atoms, their binding energy per nucleon is 12.29, and the amount of nucleons in each is our top number 12, and we have two of them, which gives me 294.96, and let's not forget our times 10 to the minus 13 joules. For our binding energy after, our neon has a binding energy per nucleon of 12.85, and it has 20 nucleons. Our helium has a binding energy per nucleon of 11.32, and it has 4 nucleons, which gives me 302.28 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Our change in energy is our energy released which gives me 7.32 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Now for our mass deficit, we know that the energy is equal to mc squared, so we know that the mass is equal to energy over c squared, where our energy is this energy here, and our c is our speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8, which gives me 8.13 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. Question 2. Low pressure sodium lamps are widely used in street lighting. The lamps produce light when an electric current is passed through sodium vapour. Almost all the light from these lamps has a wavelength of 5.89 times 10 to the minus 7 metres. Calculate the energy for a photon of light emitted from a sodium lamp. We know that the energy is equal to HF where we know Planck's constant, but we don't know the frequency. What we do know is that c, our speed of light, is equal to our wavelength times our frequency, which means that our frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Making that substitution, we get hc over the wavelength, where we know all of these things. Which gives me 3.38 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. The work function for sodium is 2.28 electron volts. Calculate the threshold frequency for the emission of photoelectrons from the surface of sodium metal, and hence the maximum wavelength of light that can cause photoemission. To find the threshold frequency, we need to find the frequency of a photon with this amount of energy, where we know that the photon energy is Planck's constant times the frequency, rearranging that for frequency by dividing both sides by Planck's constant, where we can convert 2.28 electron volts into joules by multiplying it by the charge of an electron. Which gives me 5.50 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now we know that the speed of light is our frequency times wavelength, so we know that our wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency. Putting both of these in, 
gives me 5.45 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Show that the light from a sodium lamp cannot cause photoemission of electrons from sodium metal. By considering the energy transitions involved in light production and absorption, suggest a possible reason for this. And so, in order to cause photoemission, our wavelength of light needs to be greater than this frequency here, or in other words, shorter than this wavelength of 5.45 times 10 to the minus 7. Our sodium lamp, however, gives off light at a larger wavelength, so it will not produce photoemission. To cause photoemission, the photon wavelength must be smaller than 5.45 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. The wavelength of sodium lamp photons is larger, 5.89 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. The sodium lamp produces light when electrons transition from higher to lower energy states. The energy difference between the levels producing the 5.89 times 10 to the minus 7 meter wavelength would need to be larger to produce photoemission. In 1802, William Wollaston noted the appearance of dark lines in the spectrum of sunlight. These lines are due to the presence of certain chemical elements in gases surrounding the sun. Explain why sharp dark lines appear only at specific wavelengths. Each chemical element only absorbs light with an energy equal to an available electron transition. The electrons absorb this energy and move to a higher energy level. Explain how a comparison between the spectrum of sunlight with the dark lines and the spectrum of light from a sodium lamp can identify that sodium is one of the elements in the sun's atmosphere. If the sun's atmosphere contains sodium, it will absorb light of the same energy as the sodium lamp and therefore the same wavelength. 